Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Banyan Books Podcast. My name is Ross McKeechee. I'm really excited about our guest today, Mr. Dan Millman. Dan Millman, our honored guest today, is a former world champion athlete, university coach, martial arts instructor, and college professor. After an intensive 20-year spiritual quest, Dan's teaching found its form as the peaceful warrior's way. He published the now classic book, The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, in 1980. Though the book originally went out of print, it built a word-of-mouth following and was eventually printed in paperback form by Hal Kramer, a retired publisher who believed in Dan's work. In 2006, that book went on to be adapted into a feature film titled Peaceful Warrior, starring Nick Nolte. Much of Dan's time is devoted to speaking. His keynotes, seminars, and workshops span the generations of influence, span the generations to influence men and women from all walks of life. Dan is a sincere student, practitioner, and teacher whose work continues to evolve over time to meet the needs of a changing world. Our honored guest's 18 books, including The Life You Were Born to Live and Everyday Enlightenment, have inspired and informed millions of readers in 29 languages worldwide. Today, Dan Millman is with Banyan Books in conversation for a special book launch event. His new book is titled Peaceful Heart, Warrior Spirit, The True Story of My Spiritual Quest. In this autobiography, he shares the fruits of a decades-long spiritual journey, guided by four radically different mentors who he simply calls the professor, the guru, the warrior priest, and the sage. From this foundation, built in layers over time, Dan developed a practical approach to living that he calls the peaceful warrior's way. Dan's story sheds light on our universal search for a fulfilling and meaningful life. And as I read the book, I was touched by his gentle yet radical honesty about his mentors and about his own challenges and pitfalls as a human being learning and evolving on his journey. This book is incredibly concise for a memoir, filled with engaging stories and profound lessons for all of us. In the end, Dan provides an antidote to endlessly seeking the good life, and instead shows us how to appreciate the grandest life of all, the one that we're born to live. Dan and his wife, Joy, live in Brooklyn, New York. They have three grown daughters and five grandchildren. If you'd like to learn more about our guest books, events, and online courses, and check out the free Life Purpose Calculator, you can visit his website, which is peacefulwarrior.com. Banyan Books community, please join me in a warm welcome for Dan Millman. Thank you for being here, Dan. Thank you, Ross. And I'd like to express my appreciation to Banyan for making this possible. Um, I know that uh, you and Jacob have done considerable work. I appreciate that you read the book and even saw the movie before our time together here. 
Um, I, I'm a big supporter of independent bookstores, um, but really all bookstores everywhere. It's a wonderful uh, calling to be involved with. And I know I have some friends and uh, old friends and new. I know maybe Martin and Krista are tuning in today and Michiko in the Pacific Northwest region. Um, so welcome all of you. I, I may not be able to see you, uh, but uh, no, my, I'm really happy to be sharing with you today. So before um, we get into our interview, and I love interviews and Q&A, so if questions come up for you, you can type them in uh, for, uh, and Jacob will, will uh, moderate that. And I see a note from Martin. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, anytime a question occurs to you, uh, you can put it in the Q&A uh, section and we'll deal with the questions after our interview. But before that, I, I told Ross, I thought, thought I'd share a few words, uh, kind of a new opening um, to set a context for the work. And, and I've always wanted to start with this two word, well, actually this short phrase. <clears throat> Here we go. Life sucks. <laughs> you don't often hear that from motivational speakers of that ilk, but those aren't my words. They're the words of the Buddha. Now, the Buddha didn't exactly use that phrase, but in fact, um, he was translated from Pali, I believe, the ancient uh, language. And the translations uh, leave room for interpretation. Uh, what the Buddha did say was life is suffering. But even that leaves some questions for us. What does he mean life is suffering? Because he used the word dukkha, I believe, which uh, means dissatisfaction or, or craving, uh, um, unrest. Um, but is life suffering for crickets or raccoons or uh, a bison uh, for the other, those in the animal kingdom? Or was the Buddha referring to human suffering? human caused psychological suffering, um, not life in general. And perhaps it was because of craving and dissatisfaction um, that, that uh, is a bad habit on our part. Uh, it could also be said that life is beautiful. Uh, both, that's paradoxical that both are true. Um, beauty is, surrounds us, inspiration, moment to moment, spirit, interpenetrates us, but often we don't have the free attention to notice that. And that is the challenge for all of us because we're preoccupied with what am I going to do with my relationship, my finances, my career decisions, uh, my body and physical ailments and challenges. So because we're preoccupied, we don't necessarily have the free attention, uh, except when we go on vacation or a holiday or a new environment, then we wake up and look at everything and look around with the eyes of a child. Um, so, you know, the, the Serbian proverb, uh, two men looked out of prison bars. One saw mud, the other saw stars. Both mud and stars exist. Life is difficult, uh, filled with dissatisfaction, um, not enoughness, uh, but it's also filled with great beauty. So we can't ignore the mud or deny it or we step in it, but we also want to remember the stars. And that's a good context, I think, for our discussion today. Uh, and, and what does all that have to do with the new book? You'll find out um, because we are seeking something more, something better, something purer, uh, this idea of the spiritual search. And I believe we're all in a spiritual quest, whether we'd phrase it in those words or not. Some of you might, but many people don't. Uh, maybe it's not even conscious, but we're all seeking fulfillment, happiness, satisfaction, love, understanding, and, and meaning in our lives. Uh, so with that context, uh, thank you for letting me make these opening remarks, and we can get on, Ross, with this uh, lively interview. Thank you, Dan. That's a wonderful introduction. Uh, you know, um, this book, uh, it was really beautifully done, and I know uh, to create a, a memoir, that's only 200 pages, it's very concise and very engaging. And I understand that it started out at more like a 500 or so page draft. Uh, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your process of reflecting on your life and writing it, and then also how, how you managed to, to bring it down to the form that it's in now. Sure, thank you for asking that. Many of the readers might be curious. 
um, because this was my first memoir. Uh, I've written a, a blend of fact and fiction, autobiography and fiction, and, and pure fiction in some of my books, um, basically novels. And so it seemed time. It seemed the appropriate time for the memoir. I've never pre-planned or strategized in terms of what books I would write when. They just they were like planes on a, a fog-shrouded runway. I never knew which one was going to get to the front of the runway first and say, write me. But it just happened organically with each of my various books. And I've never just uh, pumped out books. Yes, I've written 18. It sounds like that's a lot of books. It only took me 40 years to do it. Um, but finally, it was time for the memoir. And I wanted to write it when I had enough life to reflect on with some perspective. Um, I have more life to look back on at, you know, I'm nearly 76 years old next month. Um, so I have more life to look back on than forward to objectively. But I also wanted to write it while I was able to gather up these memories um, with, with my full mental faculties. <laughs> so th this seemed like the appropriate time to do it. And the first year working on the book was simply a memory dump, a download. Where did I live when? It's often difficult to reconstruct if you haven't kept a journal, um, which I unfortunately didn't actually in way my books are my journal. But so I ended up uh, just working on getting the right order and doing it from beginning as a toddler up through the present time. But then I ended up with an overwritten, um, uh, kind of an unruly hedge of a book, which I needed to turn into a bonsai um, and prune it down uh, to what's most relevant. Jack London once said, it takes hard writing to make easy reading. So I put in the work to make it accessible, engaging. I'd rather my reader go, oh, I wish there were a little bit more than when is this going to be over? So that's, that was my aim. Uh, it's tightly written. Uh, and at the end of the book, I provide a link to a web page with even more information, some bonus content. So that's a long answer to uh, that pithy question, but I, I hope that was, as background, somewhat illuminating. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Now, starting early in your life, you had a, a, a foreshadowing moment. I think it was your friend, Steve Yusa, who said to you, stop thinking about it and just jump. Or stop thinking and jump. And that, that was kind of almost a metaphor for your life in many ways after that. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. Uh, as as a, a little boy, I, my first role model, uh, well, other than my, my parents, uh, uh, was Steve Yusa, a Japanese uh, uh, young man. There were many Japanese families in our neighborhood and Hispanic as well in Los Angeles. And uh, he and his friends who were, they were streetwise, they were three years older than I was. I was about maybe five or six uh, and, and they were about nine years old. So sophisticated, you know. <laughs> um, and they, they found a house under construction. We used to love to climb on houses that are under construction on the weekend, the workers weren't there. And so we'd climb all around the house like little monkeys. And we got up to the roof and there was, there was a, um, a big sand pile down below, about 20 feet below the roof. It was a big two-story house. And, you know, Steve jumped off the roof, landing, uh, sinking up to his knees in the sand pile. And then his friends followed and they said, come on, Danny, your turn. But I was younger and I was really afraid. I went to the edge and I pulled back and I went to the edge and I really wanted to jump, but I was just so afraid. And finally, that's when Steve yelled, Danny, stop thinking and jump. And I knew I could do that. I knew how to bend my knees, lean forward and push. And I did that. And I found myself soaring in space, sinking up to my knees in the pit. And we did that for the next hour or two, just run, climbing up and jumping off. And a bit of early flight in my life. Um, so that became a metaphor. Um, it served me well in gymnastics, not always in relationships, um, as I described in the book, but that was one of those moments. We've all had moments in our lives. You know, uh, I believe it was, uh, uh, Cesare Pavese who said, we do not remember days. We remember moments. And so that's what I tried to share in the book. Wonderful. Thank you. You, you mentioned gymnastics. By 18 years old, you were the world trampoline champion. 
and and you ended up at at University of California on the gym uh, gymnastics team there. Um, can you tell us a bit about the role that that played in your early life and shaping your approach to living? Sure. Since that's part of my bio, it's like a spoiler. People know, you know, that I did win the world championship. But the book, after the preface, the book actually opens up in midair, appropriately, at the world championship in Royal Albert Hall in London. Um, and, and so they know I won, but they don't know how it got there. And it was through very strange circumstances that I ended up um, coming out on top in that particular competition but it that was the beginning of my spiritual practice i had no idea i've never heard the term spiritual practice as a young man starting out on trampoline just discovered i love jumping up and down and trying different stunts like many young people today um but i never knew that would lead to a scholarship to college a gymnastics career and uh end up teaching at oberlin college and so on um, who knows the winding paths of our lives? You might have had similar experiences, whether it was music or math or something else you discovered. Um, but it became that metaphor. It became a way to experience the moment of silence, the moment of truth, total absorption, zone, flow, whatever term we use for it. And when I finally started coaching after my gymnastics career, I, I gained a lot. You see, athletes uh, are, are generally pretty smart. Now, we may have the, the stereotype of, of the dumb jock, you know, the, the big lineman on the football team or whatever, but athletes uh, who are coordinated, um, their nervous system through their spine is connected to the brain. So I've never seen a dumb athlete. I've seen athletes who are not academically motivated or interested. Um, so maybe their grade point average doesn't reflect their smarts, but athletes learn about spiritual laws. They learn how life works process and presence um, and I did though again I wasn't conscious of what I was learning because many athletes are focused on the game the points the match winning and losing rather than what they're actually learning in the process so to me uh, sports are spiritual training of course most everything is a form of spiritual training um, so then when I started coaching I, I emphasized some of these more holistic uh, big picture elements that we weren't just training to go into a competition and beat someone else and then we go to the next competition. It was more a way uh, called Do, you know, in Japan, Dao in, in Chinese. Um, and so I describe in the book that emphasis. And for example, one quick note, the coach from Uni University of Southern California, he brought his team up to compete at Stanford where I was coaching. And he said, Danny, took me aside and said, I, I heard rumors you have your team meditate before competitions. Now, this is when meditation was a fringe activity for out outliers, really, at that time, back in the late 60s. Uh, it had not been expanded with yoga and everything else at that time. Well, I turned to him and I said, no, I'd never have my team meditate before a competition. I have them meditate during the competition. And I guess one day he got that. Uh, I'm sure you do. That's so wonderful. That's so wonderful. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the environment you found yourself in, uh, in your university years. And then when you're coaching at Stanford, there's a huge movement going on in, in terms of the spiritual unfolding uh, in America. Um, uh, everyone from Ram Das and all these Eastern teachers coming what was, what was it like in, in California in that time and place? Well, I, I, I appreciate the question because it did happen within that context of the times. Counterculture 60s, the, uh, the spiritual quest, uh, which came of age more in the 70s. And the 80s was more the human potential movement fully blossomed uh, and, and reshaped itself into the popularity of yoga and other disciplines today and a spiritual approach to martial arts and so on as personal development. So, um, well, in the 60s, I was in, you know, right in, immersed in the, the Sproul Hall free speech movement um, of, of the late 60s and the anti-war protests. Um, and then at Oberlin College, well, at Stanford University also, there was a, a good deal of, uh, you know, students have high ideals. Uh, and 
at that age, they're still wanting to remake the world and that's wonderful. Um, so they, there was also uh, anti-war protests while I was at Stanford. Uh, all that passed as a backdrop in my life. I, I kept a kind of a tunnel vision focus on training, uh, education and teaching in a meaningful way. I, I loved teaching my beginning classes even more than working with the elite team that I developed at Stanford, including the top US Olympian. Um, it was because I knew that change happened at the level of the individual. So mass movements, there were enough people in, engaged in that. And I tried to exert the right leverage uh, through uh, focusing on individuals. And, and there is a story that I tell um, about Socrates and I uh, walking down the street during the Vietnam War and student protests happening. And, and I was doing a great deal of work, you know, according to the way of the peaceful warrior on myself, self-analysis, self-massage, um, and a lot of self-oriented work um, for reasons I couldn't quite yet see. And so we walked by some posters, one about saving, uh, uh, you know, starving children and one oppressed peoples in the Vietnam War. And I said, Socrates, I feel kind of selfish and guilty doing all this work on myself when there are so many people in need out there. Shouldn't I be more of a social activist? Um, and he turned to me and in a non sequitur, he said, Dan, take a swing at me. And I went, what? Did you hear what I was just saying? He said, come on, I'll give you five bucks if you can slap me on the cheek, go for it. So I bobbed and weaved and I took a quick swing at him, found myself on the ground in a rather painful wrist lock. And I got this scene into the movie two weeks before they started shooting. So he lets me up and says, Dan, you notice a little leverage can be very effective. I, I shook out my wrist. Yeah, I noticed Socrates. And he said, well, you want to help people. Of course, do what you're motivated and moved to do. Follow your heart, but don't ignore the work on yourself. So you can develop the clarity uh, and the courage to, to know and the wisdom, the perspective, to know how to exert the right leverage at the right place at the right time. And that's what I strove to do ever since then. And it turned out as a writer and, and speaker and teacher. So that brings us to this present moment. Wonderful. You know, um, that reminds me of, of the, you share an Aikido proverb, which is a theme. You just sort of mentioned this, this theme running throughout your life. And the proverb is learn one day, teach one day. Can you tell us how, how that that idea that idea sort of showed up in your life and how you've tried to live it sure well I, I learned that in gymnastics even when i was a kid jumping on the trampoline i'd figure out how to do a move because our, our our coach really didn't understand biomechanics or techniques or progressions he was a former printer his kids had got him interested in opening a trampoline center but so we had to figure out ourselves how to do everything and we experimented and tried progressions and and so in having to do that and analyze, we got an in-depth understanding of biomechanics and um, how, to, how to learn. So um, I would learn a move and then I'd share it with others. Hey, this has helped me. And, and so I was teaching from the very start, learning and teaching. And this is the theme of my life. Maybe some of yours, the listeners today, you, you learn, you teach, uh, depending on the context. And so... Um, when I was doing martial arts in Aikido, you know, I was a beginner. I didn't have anything to teach except some perspectives I'd learned in gymnastics. Um, but at, when I got a little more experience, I began to offer helping others. Uh, in, in the medical profession, surgeons also have a similar saying. They say, you know, for doing surgeries, they say, watch one, do one, teach one. <laughs> Um, that may be a little bit radical, uh, but it gives the idea. You don't have to wait until you have a credential hanging on your wall necessarily. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting credentials and advanced degrees. Um, people ask me if I have a PhD and I say, no, but I teach PhDs. <laughs> so uh, you just offer what you have and you don't have to wait necessarily until you feel sufficiently qualified. Um, I don't know how many of you out there would view yourself as a manager, that you manage other people at a workplace. 
But to me, managers are coaches and the staff is the team. And there is an almost direct parallel correspondence between managing uh, staff and coaching the team. And I, I like the idea. I think it's more elegant to be a coach. Now, I just gave a conference for a bunch of uh, uh, dental professionals um, re last weekend. And one of them said, well, yeah, I, I view myself as a manager, but I don't know. I'm, I'm not qualified as a coach. And I said, you mean you're not qualified to support and be there for other people and listen when it's called for? You're not qualified? What degree do you need? Well, I didn't say it so bluntly, but you, you get the message behind it that you don't necessarily have to wait. Uh, and again, schooling and background is helpful. We all bring our life background and our life experience. Uh, we teach ourselves in a way. And so the best teachers, in my view, by the way, are those who teach life through a, a given topic. They teach life through social studies, through math, through gymnastics. And, and to me, that's the path of mastery, connecting everything to our daily lives. Thank you. Martial arts has played a big role in your life as well. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, how that's impacted you and, and the way that you teach as well. Well, before I even got into gymnastics or acrobatics, I gravitated toward martial arts. I describe in the book uh, uh, various encounters with bullies. I was the youngest kid in my class, and I explained the reasons for this in the book, um, but also one of the smaller ones. Uh, you know, my height, about five, six, uh, was good for gymnastics, not so much for basketball. Um, I looked up to people. So I was younger and smaller, and therefore maybe I talked too much as well. Um, <laughs> as you notice, a habit that stayed with me for a lifetime. Um, but that may have attracted the attention of some bullies. And, and, and because of that, it eventually, they motivated me to want to learn self-defense. And that was my beginning in the martial arts. I, uh, my dad took me, to, I begged him to teach me some self-defense. And he took me to a boxing gym where I discovered very quickly, I didn't really like hitting other people or getting hit. Um, so I moved on to judo. And from there, um, karate, Okinawan style, Okinawate, uh, think Mr. Miyagi. Um, and, and so I... I trained in the martial arts in, in high school. There was some overlap. I began gymnastics as well from trampoline. And then I had a 10 year uh, uh, latency period where I didn't really practice martial arts until after I started coaching at Stanford. And then I took up Aikido. Um, eventually got a, a black belt certificate in Aikido. So if I'm ever attacked on the street, I can whip out my certificate. You know? uh, <laughs> so, but the martial arts are different. Uh, now, today, they're, they've turned into sports and even movie martial arts that are totally impractical for actual self-defense. Uh, I always wondered why people want to, in the middle of a fight, want to do back handsprings and somersaults. It, it, waste of energy. It didn't make much sense. But it looks good on the movie screen. So martial arts have evolved in different directions. But essentially, the uh, bushido, uh, in the Japanese term, uh, kabuto, is... Uh, very sincere because in the martial arts it wasn't about winning points or games or matches it was about life and death and many combats were mortal combats um, so they knew that you had to have a focused mind and and, and clear intention uh, it was a holistic approach not just physical skills because there were people with superior skills who lost matches because they their mind was in turmoil, the emotions as well. So um, that's what's special to me about training in a martial art. And by the way, um, at any age or even physical condition, there's a martial art for everyone if they, if they have the interest. Um, as I get older, I'll probably gravitate back toward more Tai Chi. Um, but, but again, I've been in, done many martial arts. And this is significant because... It's, it may be instructive because there are some people who grab, they, they cling to one religion, one philosophy, um, one martial art, one sport, and they do that for many years. But my calling and maybe preparing me for the teaching I was to do, I have no idea, but my interests were more broad. I liked being exposed to various arts. Um, so I got perspective. 
I understood each of them better in a fuller context. And the same was true of spiritual teachings. Uh, when you read the book, um, you'll find out uh, these four mentors that I met uh, over a 20 year period and studied with some of them for years. Um, they represent, even though they're real people, absolutely. There's no fiction in the book. It's all as true as I could tell it. Um, they represent major approaches to spiritual development, personal growth. Each of them radically different from the others. Um, and so it was instructive. That's why, that's the main reason I chose to share the book and the story, not because I presumed uh, everyone wants to read about this Dan Millman character, uh, but rather uh, it may have some, offer some perspectives about the spiritual quest. And um, that's why the subtitle is the true story of my spiritual quest. It, it indeed does shed a lot of light on some really um, practical and useful things for us to discern on our journey, as well as some very profound truths. I'm wondering, maybe you can tell us about the first teacher you encountered, who you call the professor, and a little bit of background in, in, in terms of how you came into that. Is it Arika or Arika? Arika. Arika. It, it's Arika. it's named after a city in uh, Chile, right at the border of the Atacama Desert, where uh, Oscar Richazo, the professor, taught. Um, and of course, I go into hit a bit of his story to establish his creds, very unusual creds, and um, my eventual involvement with his school. Um, you know what I might do? Uh, I thought I'd share a little treat. Um, maybe s many of the readers have been waiting to read the book until uh, they receive it from Banyan. I know it comes with the ticket price. Um, and normally I'd consider this a bit of a spoiler, but I thought it would be fun addressing sure. the, ele the elephant in the room. So before we get into the four mentors, let me read you just a paragraph or two because uh, <clears throat> this may raise some questions you might want to ask. Um, we talk about these four mentors and some readers may ask, this is from the preface, what about your teacher Socrates? Is he one of the four mentors? If not, why isn't he one of the four? An understandable question since my first book in the Peaceful Warrior Saga blends autobiography and fiction, leaving just enough ambiguity to lend an air of mystery about the old service station sage I called Socrates. To resolve such ambiguity, I now offer this small revelation. I am Socrates. That is to say, the literary character I named after the ancient Greek is a projection of my own psyche. I was not Sock's student, but his creator. As my muse, he assisted in his own creation. Our dialogues were not remembered conversations, but flowed forth as I wrote them. My 2006 novel, The Journeys of Socrates, conveys an imagined life of this literary character and the experiences that tempered his spirit. So to put it another way, a Socrates is real. Dan Millman is a fictional character. <laughs> of those of my readers and seminar attendees who desired a teacher like Socrates had him all along. Just as young Arthur had Merlin, Frodo had Gandalf, Luke Skywalker had Yoda, Daniel San had Mr. Miyagi, and Carlos Castaneda had Don Juan Matus. Mentors and students from life and legend, I had my Socrates. His teachings were born from the experiences I'll describe in the chapters that follow. So uh, that may be no surprise to some of you or a big one to others, but there we are. And so some people might ask, well, wait a minute. Uh, if you didn't have Socrates in your book, Way of the Peaceful Warrior, if he was your creation, how did you learn all this stuff? And the book, this new book is my answer to that question. So with that context, I'm, I'm happy to get into the, a little bit about each of the four mentors, um, just to give you a taste, since you're going to be reading about them soon enough anyway. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. And just a reminder to everybody here live, 
please put in your, uh, your questions for Dan in the Q and A tab. I see they've already started rolling in. We're going to get to as many of those as we can towards the last portion of, of our event today. So Dan, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, um, what drew you, where you were at in life, what drew you to Oscar Ichazo's uh, Arika School and, and how you got involved? Well, all of us have experienced some synchronicities, coincidences, and that sort of thing in our lives. And I believe, well, let me put it this way. Um, fairly early on in my life, I was obsessed with self-improvement. I not only loved to learn, I learned yo-yo tricks and, and ventriloquism and sleight of hand, you know, magic. Um, I took memory courses and speed reading uh, and then the martial arts and the acrobatics. I just loved to, and, and I, one of my favorite books from high school was uh, not, not an assigned book. It was Word Power Made Easier, 30 Days to a More Powerful Vocabulary. So I just knew I had to prepare, but I had no idea for what. So I was really into self-improvement. And, and, but one day, probably after my college years or during, I realized no matter how much I improved, only one person benefited. But if I could somehow, I had no idea how, if I could influence the lives of other people in a positive way, that made my own life more meaningful, touch other lives. So I was called to be a teacher. Not everybody is, but it was for me. And I think that commitment to share what I learned with others rather than hoard it myself um, led me to these four mentors. And the way it worked, uh, I was actually an assistant professor at Oberlin College in Ohio. And I saw on a bulletin board uh, an advertisement, kind of a, a notice for faculty, uh, only faculty, they could apply for a travel grant over a summer, a research grant, but they had to travel around the world. They couldn't just go to one place. And that, I didn't mind that at all. Um, so I applied for it and soon after found out I'd qualified. There was money available for it. And so I committed to traveling. Uh, my, my, my wife, my first wife, Linda, uh, my then wife was uh, comfortably in a dorm. We were dorm directors. Over the summer, and my daughter Holly was about uh, four and a half then. Uh, she was home with her mom and was settled into her summer school and so on, or preschool. And so I ended up going on this research trip. And to travel to the mysterious east, I started by going west to California from Ohio. And on the impulse, and here's really the answer to the question on impulse. I called a friend of mine, a former teammate of mine on the Cal gymnastics team. There was more to, to him and his influence in my life that I mentioned in the book. That's why I decided to call him. Um, he said, Dan, you know, we hadn't been in touch for a while. And he said, I've just completed a life-changing training. And if there's any way for you to do this, drop everything. Because it's starting in three days in San Francisco. And he, his, he spoke with such authority, such certainty and credibility, because I knew him well, um, that I looked into it. And I said, you know, I have an open ticket. At the time, you could buy a Pan Am, Pan American ticket that was just open. There was no scheduled flights. I could fly wherever I wanted, anywhere in the world. Um, so I said, well, I'll just stay in San Francisco for the next 40 days and do this Arika 40-day intensive training, 10 hours a day for 40 days straight. And let's just say it was uh, hugely impactful. There had never been a training on the planet as holistic. It was based on a global heritage of spiritual traditions, the higher practices, put together in a brilliant way by the professor. I could have called him the headmaster of this school. Uh, I hadn't met him at all, but it was, he was manifesting through his school. And so I ended up doing this 40 day training later an advanced training and then more work after that. Um, I don't think I'm going to say why I left, why I moved on. You'll find out in detail in the book since you'll read it anyway. 
So let me just say I ended up moving on after some, you know, maybe a year, even teaching uh, as a teacher in, in the, the training. But then I discovered the guru who's talk about radically different. His method of working with people had nothing to do with techniques. He said, I'd rather beat you with a stick than tell you to meditate your way to enlightenment, for example, which uh, is rather unusual. Um, and he offered brilliant perspectives. He was an American born spiritual teacher. For some reason, my authenticity thing, you know, some of us maybe have had past lives, who knows, in India. So we gravitate toward Ayurveda and, and uh, the, uh, Vedanta and the Indian uh, teachers. Other people, they, they relate to China and they do acupuncture and moxibustion and um, the Chinese five element theory. and and Chinese martial arts, and they just somehow feel a resonance with that culture. Uh, and that's all great. But for me, I wanted something generic. I didn't want to just get fascinated with one culture or another culture. I wanted human culture. So this training reflected that. And the guru was an American-born guy, uh, his ordinary name, Franklin Jones. And he, he wrote a book that just absolutely knocked me out. Uh, it was a memoir. And I have that listed at the end of the book through that web link. Um, in any case, after reading that, I, I uh, ended up approaching the community, um, living in a community household. That's when Joy came out. And she's been, of course, with me ever since through all the four mentors. Uh, she had also trained in Eureka, as I describe in the book. And by the way, let me take a brief tangent here. Um, Joy read every draft of the book, all nine drafts that I did in working on this book. And around the seventh draft, she said, you know, Dan, I have a little different perspective uh, than you've described. I was with you at the time. And uh, she didn't disagree on facts, but just her interpretation and, and experience. She said, what if I wrote a little something for the book? And I went, that's a great idea. I uh, jumped on it and she did. And I did light editing, that's all. Um, and so about 10 pages of Joy's commentaries are sprinkled throughout the book. Many people seem to enjoy those. Um, so anyway, uh, she was with me through that time with the guru and uh, almost eight years as a student and mediocre devotee, I think. Uh, and I learned a great deal and I'm grateful to all the teachers. Now, near the end of that time, with the guru after you know seven or eight more years had passed. That's when I wrote Way of the Peaceful Warrior. I, I was just bursting to share some of the insights that I'd had. And I wasn't parroting the words of the professor or the guru, but they did have some elements. For example, many of you remember the phrase paradox, humor, and change, which was on Sock's business card in my first book. But that came from the guru. Uh, maybe you remember Socrates taught me this bone massage, this deep, very deep massage one night in the gas station. I learned that from the professor. So they did have elements that, that shone through. And my first two mentors of the four were the primary influence in writing Way of the Peaceful Warrior. But even going through all the four mentors, I don't just parrot their words. They need their teachings we need to happen within the, the container of their school to, uh, to fully grasp. Um, so that wouldn't have been appropriate. But what they did was they opened doors in my own psyche, uh, doors of insight that allowed me to express in my own way an approach to living I ended up calling the Peaceful Warrior's Way. Uh, maybe I'll describe later how I end up with that term, Peaceful Warrior. But um, That would be great. Well, why don't I do that? Should I do yeah, that now? Yeah, please, please. Okay, yeah. Okay, because uh, we don't necessarily need to cover in depth the two other mentors, except that they were each uh, unique and different from the others. But I was teaching a course at, at Oberlin College. Uh, I taught one called Mirthful Movement, which was like a circus course, juggling and acrobatics and so on. And I taught another course I created called Way of the Warrior. Uh, that's what I named it for the catalog. And it had to do with the basic, the rudiments of Aikido and Tai Chi. Uh, but then I realized before I finalized the title, 
uh, I said, wait a minute, these are internal martial arts. They're, they're not aggressive martial arts. They're more uh, receptive, uh, defensive. So then, it, then a light bulb went on and I went, hey, why don't I call it the way of the peaceful warrior? And that's when the term was coined organically in my life. And, uh, you know, many years later when I wrote the book, it just seemed like the appropriate title. So that's how it came about. Um, so after these years with the guru, I explain in the book why I moved on and an object lesson for many of us as far as dealing with spiritual mentors and gurus uh, with whom you sit in, in what's called uh, satsang and you just gaze at them and they gaze back at the people gathered and they are shining or radiating the divine reality the transcendent and that is the way you you catch it so to speak that they transmit this force not through techniques like i learned with the professor breathing techniques and 50 different kinds of meditation for different purposes and, uh, uh, and so on and body work and mind body work so i'd been through the techniques and i i, I spent many years uh with a transcendental master um then I discovered through a, more synchronicities uh, that I described um, the warrior priest. And he was a former bounty hunter and adventurer and bush pilot, uh, did some race car driving. He was an adventurer, highly dramatic, exciting to be around. Life was more exciting around him. A great charisma. He was sort of a spiritual badass, basically. Uh, cool uh, definition of cool and he was also a metaphysician and a healer very good at what he did and from him i learned the rudiments of the life purpose system based on you know what i eventually wrote i had 20 pages of notes from the lectures he gave at an advanced training uh, and eventually i uh, expanded those notes after seven more years of doing readings for people to an over 400 page reference book uh, ex you know, expressing the uh, life purpose system. Uh, Can you and, tell us a little bit about yeah. the essence of the life purpose system? I, for me personally, and I know our producer, Jacob, we both found that book so profoundly helpful in our lives. Can you tell for our, our audience uh, just a bit about the essence of what, what that's about? Sure. Uh, early in our acquaintanceship, uh, the warrior priest said, I want you to meet me in my, my house in Mill Valley. He was renting a house there. Uh, and I met with him and he said, Dan, I'm going to offer you a reading. Uh, I said, I hadn't had any readings before. Um, he said, I'm going to tell you some things maybe about your life that might be helpful. Some insights about the hurdles you're here to overcome and the, the strengths you have, innate strengths. And he proceeded to change my life in one hour. Uh, he, he did a, a past life reading, which I view now as metaphorical, because who knows, you know, who can say for sure, but it resonated with me. There was something about it. And then he went on to give me some information and some spiritual laws to help overcome the hurdles. If I could apply these laws in my life, they would help me overcome the particular hurdles, and weak areas of my life. And it had a profound effect. Actually, I wasn't really stepping forward as a teacher uh, the way I am now. I'm, I taught gymnastics, but I didn't really teach larger themes until I met the warrior priest and had that reading. I decided to step into my own shoes, so to speak. Um, many of us are waiting for that kind of you know, impulse. So then he announced later on he was going to be teaching an advanced training. Now, I knew him. We, we became friends in a sense that we traveled together up to Alaska to teach a group of psychotherapists. Um, and, and so I knew him personally, whereas I really, the guru was an aloof figure up on a stage. And, and uh, the same with the professor who I spoke with once uh, only. So this was a very different experience. And he announced he was going to teach the basics of the system because, you know, I asked him, he was so accurate. I said, are you a psychic? He said, no, I'm not a psychic. I've been trained to know where to look. Now he was implying where in the Akashic record, 
the, the, the supposed record of all that's ever unfolded on the planet, um, all knowledge, and he, he claimed to be able to access it, uh, which is a bit colorful, but he had a way of, of, of describing things that way. And when he announced he was going to be teaching that method of where to look, well, I was intrigued along with about 18 other people. And, and on the island of Maui, on Hawaii, we did an advanced training where we did some knife fighting, spiritual growth through knife fighting, um, which I eventually turned into a training called the courage training. I taught for 14 years. Um, and I immediately went home and started doing readings with using my notes for relatives, friends, for free. Later on, I started charging a fee when I'd internalized the knowledge. And I began doing that in person, uh, over the phone, and then doing uh, cassette tapes back then and sending them to people. Um, so that's where it came from. That's how it developed. And it was only seven years later that I said, it's time. Well, I actually taught uh, uh, life purpose trainings, several of them, to train people to do these kinds of readings the way I learned it, hopefully even better. Uh, but then it, it, it became an urgent, pressing matter. It's time to write a book. And uh, it was a very challenging book to write, as you can imagine. But that's where the life you were born to live came from. And by the way, we couldn't think of a title. Joy and I tried. We kicked it around. You know, I, I usually come up with my own titles, but we, we brainstormed. We were going to call it the number book, the life purpose book. Um, but we were walking through the living room one day. Our daughters, our little daughters, they were young men. They were watching The Sound of Music. Just as the Mother Superior was telling Maria, you have to go out and find the life you were born to live. And that, then she started singing, climb every mountain, you know, forward every stream. So um, that's where the title came from. And that's how they, they sometimes pop up when, when you're dreaming of titles. It's a wonderful that's book, awesome. really wonderful book. And just Thank a reminder, I, I mentioned it in the intro, but if you, if you want to check out the, the Dan's free life purpose calculator, you can check it out on his website. Um, peacefulwarrior.com. Oh, by the way, uh, I need to mention because I believe, uh, in fact, I know that Martin and, and his wife, uh, Krista, are uh, joining us for this presentation. Martin, uh, a dear friend, we've developed this friendship over the years. Um, he was the developer and creator of the Life Purpose app. It used to be an app for phones, like any app, but he got tired of having to update it every time Apple did an update. Um, so now it's web-based entirely, uh, lifepurposeapp.com. And um, he created that. Um, and, he, you know, he, after practically memorizing the entire book, he knows that system as well as I do, I think now. Uh, maybe better. Um, he's really... So anyway, I wanted to acknowledge that. And he's, he's joining us today for the, the presentation. So thank you. Now, the, the, the fourth teacher, you... you uh, endearingly called the sage. Um, can you tell us a little bit about him? Uh, his, his teaching was, was uh, profound, profoundly different from any of the other teachers in a way. Yes. And I, I'd like to emphasize two things. Uh, one is after my time with the professor and an amazing school, and after years with the guru, I was not looking for any other teachers. I'd had the two you know, best teachers. Um, by the way, I need to qualify that statement. One of the central tenets of this approach to living I call the peaceful warrior's way is that there is no best teacher, no best book, no best philosophy, no best religion or diet or martial art or exercise system. There is only the best for each of us at a given time of our lives. Life is an experiment. We have to find out what works for us. So I respect uh, your process, everyone's process. We have to find out what works for us. So, but these were heavy hitters. These teachers were really, uh, they had the mojo. And so at, at that point, why would I look for another teacher? I, I learned, I think, great wisdom over the years. But then I stumbled across the warrior priest and it was like a, a, an apprenticeship. And, and really launched my, my teaching career. 
And so after that, you can imagine why, you know, would I want another teacher? And then I was looking through a tape catalog. Sounds true. Some of you may have heard of this company, um, a, a good tape company. Uh, and they do books too as well. And uh, I was going to do a, a tape program with them. And they, as a courtesy, uh, Tammy, the, the president of Sounds True, sent me a catalog and said, if there are any programs that, that catch your eye, uh, we'd be happy to send them to you. And I was looking through it, none, you know, at one point it would, I would have been like the proverbial kid in a candy store. I want that. I've got to do that. Oh, I need to hear about this. How can I miss this? The FOMO, fear of missing out, you know? Um, and none of it really called to me at this point in my life. It showed me where I was, you know, it's just like, okay, yeah, and they're done that. But then I came across a little program with a modest title. It was constructive living gee how to live constructively whether no matter what you're thinking or feeling that seemed appealing and so i got the, the program listened to it then bought almost all of his this author's books david k reynolds a phd in anthropological psychology he went to graduate school with carlos castaneda they graduated in the same class um and Wow, he brought me back down to earth. Uh, simplified my life radically. After I'd been in the sky of mind, metaphysical abstract ideas and notions and the higher regions of experience and the numinous and the transcendent, he brought me down to earth. Um, so that's what I would say about the sage. And there's more, certainly. You'll see why he differed from not only other teachers, but many psychotherapists. Um, and so it was really a full circle and we're still in touch. We email back and forth now and then. Um, and there's more to the story, but it's written down in a book. Yes. You're going to be getting so. A captivating book. I must say we have a lot of, uh, of questions coming in here. Uh, good. Are, you, are you good? If we get to some of our audience questions, Dan. Perfect. Okay. First one is from Heather who says, what do you say to people who are depressed that there was no Socrates? I cried when I read that in the book. Well, thank you, Heather. I appreciate the question. You just have to make a mental shift. There is a Socrates. And I hope this doesn't sound like hubris, but again, he's talking to you right now. I created him. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. I don't think I'm, I'd be depressed to learn there was no Merlin or, or no... Uh, I mean, there isn't a Mr. Miyagi. He's a movie character. <laughs> so the point is, these are archetypes. And the reason, I, and I, as I explained in the book, I did meet an old guy in a gas station about three in the morning who impressed the heck out of me. He was a cosmic old guy. I went home and wrote an epic poem. I no longer have it, but I mentioned this in the book. Um, and so when it was time to write a book, I said, how can I share what I wanted to share with people? So look, there were people after the book came out, Heather, that um, were really disappointed to learn that Socrates couldn't really jump up on rooftops. Uh, and that seemed like the whole point of the book. Well, if he couldn't jump up on rooftops, why listen to him? But I used that as a literary device to pull my character, Dan, back into the gas station again and again to find out how he did it. Um, so, well, let me put it this way, Heather. Somebody came up to me once after uh, a talk I gave and said, Dan, I, I'm feeling something. I, I, I guess I'm feeling really inspired. I said, don't worry, it'll pass. And the reason I mentioned that relative to your question is that if you cried and felt a little depressed that my gosh, Socrates didn't really exist, It'll pass. All things pass. Uh, feelings come and go. And so I, I guess it shows the depth of your connection and, and inspiration. And I appreciate that. There's a saying that the measure of our sorrows is also the measure of our joys. So maybe you're a passionate person and, and feel uh, sad to learn that, that Socrates was a character I created based on the old fellow I'd met. You see, I... I I wanted to convey the idea that you can find wisdom uh, in many unexpected places, even an old service station. 
not just with people wearing beads and a, a white or ochre robe um, who, who, with a long beard uh, or a nun's robe. Um, you can find wisdom in many places. And that was my best intention. And, you know, it's funny, if I hadn't created Socrates, actually the, the draft, the second to last draft of Way of the Peaceful Warrior was a self-help book. Um, I mentioned this, I met this old gas station guy, and here's what I learned from him. And the entire rest of the book was just my bullet points of, of stuff that would be good to keep in mind about life. But my editors said, wait a minute, I, I'm intrigued by this old guy you described meeting in the gas station. Can you tell us more about him? What interactions did you have with him? So I ended up creating a story around that one meeting. And that became Way of the Peaceful Warrior. And it served a higher good. Uh, Picasso said, art is a lie that helps us to see the truth. And that was my intention. And so there we are. Best answer I could offer. Hope that helps. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. And thanks for your, your question, Heather. There's a question from Michael who says, Dan, Mr. Millman, during the course of your journey into writing, did you ever consider how your books were aiding those that suffered from substance abuse? The reason for asking is from personal experience, the two catalysts for addiction, in my humble opinion, are trauma and the loss of faith or spiritual identity. The book, The Peaceful Warrior, I engaged when I was still deeply involved, consumed in addictive addiction. Even that being stated, your book helped me to begin to look at my spiritual identity again, my spiritual being rather than my human form or frailty. So the question in there again is, did you ever consider in your writing how that was eating people that were uh, suffering an addiction? Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, Michael, when I wrote the book during the writing, it never even occurred to me. Um, now I had a family member that I don't write about in the book who was addicted to heroin and went to prison and so on. Um, so it's not that I was unfamiliar with that experience. I was in, uh, beginning high school, I think when police came. Uh, anyway, there's more to that story, but that's for their memoir, not mine. So I just, for now, let me just say, uh, no, it was not conscious on my part. But of course, in the years that followed, I heard from many people who were uh, drug counselors, rehab people, uh, and people in, in uh, recovery. Um, and I was absolutely, you know, thrilled and delighted. I, I, I actually spoke at, at uh, a rehab center, mm, earlier this year uh, or maybe end of last year um, that where many people had been impacted um, and, and the head by the way the head of this rehab center the president of it is Mackenzie Phillips maybe you've heard um, John Phillips and, and China uh, John Phillips daughter um, she uh, was a, a, a actress in, in films and tv and she's just a really great, grounded, wise person. And she was one of the people who invited me to speak. So I have been in, in contact uh, with that community. And you know, the only people that I admire more than people who've never had to deal with addictions, uh, the people I admire most are those who've had to deal with addictive behaviors and uh, are in recovery. Uh, it's been your spiritual path, I think you'd agree. Um, and I'm, I'm so happy that if, if my work uh, has helped in that. And I, looking back, I can only say that many people are in a quiet despair, a desperation. Um, even if their lives look comfortable uh, from the outside, they can be successful people, but they're uh, lost and, and don't have a sense of their own worth and connection to life. And maybe Way of the Peaceful Warrior offered a glimpse into some hope and promise and uh, inner strength and in seeing my character struggle, my adolescent struggle with the character I called Socrates. So I'm glad the reminders that I offered in that book uh, were helpful in, in your own life. So I do appreciate the question and thank you for it. Thanks, Dan, and thank you, Michael. The next question is from Bob, who says, in your books, you stress the importance of being in the present moment. 
It seems it is also important to plan for the future and make present life choices from the lessons of our past experiences. How do we find balance with the past, present, and future? Well, this course could stimulate uh, on my part um, uh, an entire seminar. <laughs> Let's just expand this into a weekend. You know, I'll just keep talking <laughs> about the present moment. But let, let me just say very briefly in summary, um, many of us are coming to realize there's no such thing as the past and future. They don't exist. The future never comes. Future happiness doesn't exist. Um, and, and what we call the past, our synaptic connections in our brain, we call memory. Uh, we remember things, but we remember them in this moment. Someone could say, I know the past exists, Dan. Look, here's a photograph, an old actual photograph of my uh, birthday 10 years ago. But all that's happening is they're showing me a photographic image in this present moment. Um, so the past is gone, except in, as memory. And the future is our imagination. It never comes. It's always tomorrow. It's always the future. Whether it's five minutes from now, doesn't exist yet. So if, if I was sitting on a, let's say you, let's say you were sitting on a rowboat, in a rowboat, and you're sitting very stably in a good posture, and you're meditating, and you're flowing down a river, let's call it the river of time. From the viewpoint of a spectator on shore, they would see you go from what looked like the past, past right in front of them to the present, and then going on down the river into the future. And yet at the same time, this river of time seems to be moving. You're sitting in this boat in absolute stillness in the eternal present. So it's not a matter of my or somebody else saying, live in the present, attend to the present. And there are many good reasons to do so. But it's a matter of realizing it's all we have. Most of our lives are spent, our mind, our body lives in the present moment but our minds flip from past to future, what we call, and it's a basic illusion. Now, it's a great human gift to be able to remember, to reflect upon, reminisce, and to imagine, including planning our day, planning our future. Just don't get too attached to the plans because life has a way of changing. You know what I mean? If you write down everything that's gonna happen that day and then check it out with what actually happens, you might be surprised. So don't get attached to the plans, but there's nothing wrong with planning our day from this present moment. Sometimes I say to Joy, oh, hey, we're going to watch this show tonight. And she'll say, Dan, but don't you want to live in the present? I say, I am living in the present. In this moment, I'm talking about a show. Gives me a sense of anticipation, like many of us. It's a simple human thing. So it's not some spiritual, serious rule. You can't think about the future or the past. Just recognize them for what they are. So that's, that's my response to the question. Yeah, of course we can plan our day and remember and imagine, uh, but let's remember the simplicity and power and sanity in this moment. We can always handle this moment. Thank you. And thanks for the question, Bob. Uh, this one is from Mary, uh, who says, Ichazo is one of the major figures in the development of the Enneagram. Do you know your Enneagram type? Yes, a qualified answer. Now, I do uh, make a brief nod in the book. I explain that when Oscar Ichazo uh, attracted 50 um, denizens of Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California, which was then the pioneer center of the human potential movement, every kind of guru and lama and teacher and martial arts teacher and psychologist and body worker, including Ida Rolf and many others came to Esalen. So there were some pretty sophisticated workshop junkies, so to speak. Um, and then they got a note from this mysterious man and he wrote this brief note, uh, a fool filled with love awaits in the desert. And he was referring to the Atacama Desert in Chile, where he taught at the Institute of Psychology at the time. And 50 Americans, including the uh, scientist researcher John Lilly, uh, the, psych the psychiatrist Claudio Naranjo, were among many others um, who went down and committed to spending almost a year, nine months to a year, training intensively, dedicating their lives uh, 
to their spiritual training. And they experimented and tested on these people, all these different methods and approaches. And uh, someone left early. Claudio Naranjo left the training early because he was so taken with the, um, see, Oscar Ichazo was the source. Now we know Gurdjieff uh, create, worked with the Enneagram. The Enneagram, for those of you who don't know, is a, a nine, is a circle with nine points on it or going around it. Uh, you can picture a star inside of it. But these nine points, Oscar called ego fixations. These were um, unconscious strategies in response to the, the particular ego, the sen point of sensitivity for each individual. So he called them ego fixations. And unlike the modern Enneagram uh, books where you just take some kind of questionnaire and you know that can be pretty subjective and deciding based on the questionnaire, which of your points, which of uh, the nine uh, types they became, the ego fixations became popularized as personality types. Um, and so instead, Oscar actually taught us eventually, uh, those who were teachers for the school, to look at a photograph of someone's face in e even lighting with their hair pulled back and to determine by observing the face and uh, either the symmetry or asymmetry of the face what ego fixation someone was working, their sensitive point. The, the goal of this, of course, was self-knowledge, deeper self-understanding to the point eventually of transcending our tendencies. Um, so it was a, a, a tool for self-knowledge. So we learned that from a, a more mystical approach, more objective in a way than taking a questionnaire. But what happened was Claudio came, went back with Oscar's permission and began to teach um, this method that came from Oscar Ichazo. Gurdjieff had no idea of the things that Oscar was teaching. He, so much information had come through him, which you'd understand once you read the book based on his background. Um, and so Naranjo started teaching in Berkeley um, and one of his students eventually who was teaching taught a woman named Helen Palmer. And she ended up writing the best-selling in the Enneagram book. It became adapted and changed. And frankly, I personally found it more clear what I was trained, um, but it was popularized and reached many more people through the, these, uh, these authors, Stephen Riso and, and but I just wanted to give a nod to Oscar. And there was a court case actually, because they never acknowledged him. And finally they admitted, yes, all this came from Oscar Ichazo, the professor. I, so as far as your question about what point, I think, I don't know what they call it today, but it was number four. Number four was the sensitive point in my own structure. Um, and yet, in terms of self-knowledge, you know, I've studied many systems, not just the Enneagram material, but, but uh, MMPI, and, and there's just so many tests, the Leuscher uh, color test, uh, diagnostic test to learn about yourself, which we all agree is quite important. Um, but the life purpose system is one of the most accessible ways to get a quantum leap in self-knowledge and a practical type of leap. So if you haven't looked at the book, you run to Banyan or order it from them online. Um, you might find it interesting. And, and or if you want it at your fingertips on your phone or whatever, you can uh, get the Life Purpose app, which has all that material. Thanks, Dan. And uh, thanks, Mary, for that question. Thank um, you, Mary. We, we have a, a question from Jacob, not our producer uh, and events curator, Jacob, but uh, another Jacob uh, who says, how, quote unquote, involved were you in the acid tests when you performed your tra trampoline talents while the Grateful Dead played? There's a story in the book for those of you who hadn't read it that this refers to. Yes. Uh, well, uh, after I shattered my leg in a motorcycle crash, which was in Way of the Peaceful Warrior in the movie and in real life, um, it shook me 
up. It shook me upward. Uh, I started asking bigger questions about life. And it wasn't long after that, as I was recovering from the shattered leg and coming back into my training, um, that I started getting curious. You know, this was Berkeley in 1967, 68. Um, I said, I, you know, I'd like to see this inner world I hear about in some of these psychedelic drugs. So I asked a friend if he could hook me up with some righteous LSD, you know, a tab of it. And so uh, I ended up in the proper setting and circumstance where I felt safe, comfortable in, in a place I was living with some friends. Uh, I took the LSD and it was a, a cosmic uh, experience for me at the time. And the set and setting are very important. Um, so I had that experience. Um, but previous to this, before I ever took LSD, by the way, I did it a second time some years later. And uh, it was a waste of my time. Uh, everybody wants to the first time. And usually that's the most profound, but not necessarily. There are people who take uh, microdoses in therapy, can be extremely useful for people. Is, is this an endorsement of LSD? No, because it's an individual matter. I don't believe in casual use of any uh, uh, drugs or s substances, including psychedelics, um, uh, including marijuana. Uh, I, to me, um, it's a sacred occasion, an entheogen, it's called. Uh, to, to meet the gods, so to speak. And so I did have that experience, but let me jump back prior to that experience. I think it was about a year before that, maybe even almost two years before that time. I was in college and somebody contacted my coach and said, we need a trampolinist. I understand you have a really good one at Cal. Is it possible he could come and do a little exhibition at the Longshoreman's Hall? in San Francisco, we're having, there's some festival. That's all I knew, some event. Um, so I showed up completely naive, straight young guy, um, young athlete, you know, I showed up and there were people, everybody was in tie dyes and it was, it turned out to be like uh, uh, the Trips Festival. Was, that's what it was called, the first Trips Festival uh, organized by Ken Kesey and his Merry Pranksters and Wavy Gravy was there and a, a new band, uh, they dubbed themselves the Grateful Dead. Um, and so I, all I knew was I showed up, I looked around at all this crowd, music playing, and they said, could you put on a, a ski mask? And they gave it to me. And I went, yeah, I put it on, put on some overalls or some, some outfit. And he said, now, you think you can do a, a trampoline routine with strobe lights going off? You know, flash, flash, flash. Imagine, you know, a hundred flash bulbs going off every second. Boom, boom, boom. And I said, yeah, I think I can. I, I've done trampolining on a moving float. I can probably handle this. And I looked up and saw a balcony and I went, would you like me to start the routine by diving off the balcony? He said, you can do that? Yeah. So I said, okay. So I climbed up in the balcony and they announced me and the, the room turned dark and the strobe lights started going off and I dove off the balcony and did a, you know, a trampoline routine. Uh, fairly you know, easy because I didn't know where the trampoline was half the time. Um, and then they finished and there was wild applause and I got off the trampoline and wandered a bit and then, uh, you know, took off my ski mask and it was like a flash mob, a one man flash mob. And then I just melted into the crowd and, and walked off. And, and only later did I learn it was the Trips Festival and the, the organizer, Stuart Brand, um, who founded the Whole Earth Catalog, uh, quite an entrepreneur and great guy. Um, he was the one that invited me and he wrote about it. And I, I share that in the book too, what his impressions were. Uh, th there was this book years later called A Long Strange Trip by Dennis McNally, a journalist who wrote about the history of the 60s and the Grateful Dead. And a friend of mine who was a deadhead, a psychotherapist, clinical psychotherapist in uh, Massachusetts, called me and said, Dan, there's this book and you, you better read page 124. I went, what is it about? And he said, well, the Grateful Dead in the 60s. I went, oh, that's nice. And so I went into a bookstore and opened it to page 124. And I went, holy moly, this is about me. I couldn't believe it. I was part of that history. But apparently the little trampoline routine was a, was a big hit. Uh, and who knew? So that's all I can tell you about uh, the acid test and Ken Kesey and the pranksters and 
that whole scene, though I did get invited. Uh, I was teaching that knife fighting training. And one of the people who came to the training was Wendy Weir, Bobby Weir's sister, who was one of the Grateful Dead, Bobby Weir. And so I ended up getting invited to sit on the side of the stage with some um, Tibetan monks um, to watch a Grateful Dead concert years later uh, through that knife fighting training. Isn't it a funny world? Okay, that's my answer. So that's my response. That's so great. I, I love how these, these questions just open up so many doors. It's, it's yeah. one. Uh, there's a, a question from Heather, and she makes a note, not the same Heather who asked the first question. It's a different <laughs> Heather. <laughs> so Heather says, I'm really intrigued by what you've written about voluntary adversity. Do you have any advice for those of us who are seeking more clarity regarding how much and what kind of voluntary adversity to take on? Well, let me give a context uh, that we all, we all, I think, can agree we've all gone through adversity challenge difficulties in our life physical emotional or mental pain uh, but i think if we look back on that time we'll note that we're a little bit wiser maybe a little bit stronger a bigger sense of perspective having gone through that difficulty sometimes climbing out of a digging our way out of a dark hole can give us the strength to climb the mountain um, so there's the innate value of adversity we don't have to go seek it uh, we don't have to pretend to like it when a difficulty comes, whether it's a physical ailment, financial dislocation, whatever it is, change, loss. But we can hold on to that thread of attention that this will make us stronger. Just, you know, for, just as we, uh, we're we still here, having gone through what we did in the past. And that has made us stronger so we can handle what comes our way. And so we keep that, appreciation for the value of adversity that's the way i express it it's not entirely original or maybe it is uh, i know many people write about that um so by voluntary adversity i mean i ask people often you know how many of you have done a sport uh, or trained as on a musical instrument uh, or learned a new language i mean all those things uh, are harder than not doing them. If you don't ever do a sport, life's easier, uh, and so on. So you get the idea that it's kind of, nobody made you do it, so it's voluntary. And uh, maintaining a relationship for more than, say, two weeks, voluntary adversity. And people laugh, but, you know, Joy and I have been married 46 years. She's my best friend, absolutely. Um, but it's, it's not always easy. We bump heads now and then. Uh, having children, voluntary adversity. It, life is easier without kids, but it's also less rich in, in, in some ways. It's one, one of life's experiences, not saying everybody has to have children. Um, so uh, taking on a business, a new business, entrepreneurial work, voluntary adversity, uh, spiritual disciplines, voluntary adversity. So again, the emphasis is we don't have to pretend to like it. No, I don't when a difficulty comes, but I do know the value of it. And, and that's really the essence of what I have to say on that topic based on my life experience. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Heather. Yeah. There's a, there's a, a question from uh, Jacqueline who says, it seems to be now in my quest for self-growth as a teacher, there is a division of the ones that want to study with me and the ones that absolutely don't want to. There is no in-between anymore. I'm still triggered by the ones that are not interested and basically run away. How to bring my spiritual warrior to keep believing in my teaching vision and myself? Wow, what a beautiful question. Um, here's, here's what I would say. When I first began teaching, uh, I had moments of envy. Like the, at Oberlin, there was a yoga teacher who was even more popular than I was. My goodness, how am I going to deal with this? Uh, I ended up taking his yoga classes. He was a very good yoga teacher. Um, but I, I was always concerned when I was teaching or talking to a group, if someone got up and left or they seemed distracted, that kind of thing got to me. But over time, I began to respect people's process more and more. And it wasn't all about me. I didn't take it personally. People have their own values, uh, their own interests, 
And it means you're teaching very clearly. If people can make a clear distinction, I really like this teacher or nope, I don't, it's not for me. It's wonderful to sort out. It's like cleaning up your mailing list, your email list. You know, it's sort out those people who aren't really interested. Uh, and remember what I said before, that there's no best teacher teaching philosophy, only the best for each of us. So thank that person, respect them for knowing that isn't for them at the time. You know, the old days, before the internet, when we used to find books uh, in bookstores, we'd go to Banyan, we'd walk along the shelves, and we'd look at this book, and this book, and this book, and you know that you go into that alpha or theta state, whatever it is, you go into that, that zone. I do, as soon as I step into a bookstore, I go into this altered state of consciousness, and I just kind of start looking at books. And some books you pass by, because you've been there, done that. Other books you pass by because you're not quite ready for them yet. But it's magical when you find the right book for you at the time. And the same goes for teachers. So maybe you're someone, you're teaching something that someone has already processed and they don't need it. Or they're not ready for you yet. And so bless them. Bless them. And, and it's uh, just appreciate their process. It's not about you. Uh, you just teach your truth. And you'll attract those who are resonating at that frequency. Such a, a wonderful answer. Thank you, Dan. Uh, it reminds me of, of one of the threads that, that runs through your work. You say this, uh, the truth is one, the paths are many. How has that been a thread that's, that's run through your life and evolved over time? Well, I don't know if I can answer the question, but what comes up for me when you ask the question, this idea of one light but many lamps, is there are teachers today. And by the way, at that link at the end of the book that you'll see, you'll see photographs. I didn't want to put any pictures, photographs in the book, but there are photographs of uh, things I write about in the book, uh, my youth, but also photographs of the four mentors and their books. And I also have a list of hundreds of various teachers from the traditions, present and past. And how do we find our teacher? How, how do we sort out the teachers? Some of them are brilliant, beautiful people who walk the talk, talk the talk, walk the walk, um, and represent their teachings and embody it and speak with real authority because they're living it. Others are deluded or uh, lead people astray into more illusions. Um, but people seem to find the teachers they need at the time. Uh, and there are teachers today who are very popular that I don't particularly resonate with uh, or, or see the same thing, but other people do. So, Again, we, we each find our own way, our own path, and I continue to express as clearly as I can, without jargon, um, this approach to living that speaks to all of us because we're all peaceful warriors in training. And that's what I'll continue to do. It's probably a nice way to, to wrap up. Um, and, and if anybody does want to stay in touch or has other questions, you can always reach me through peacefulwarrior.com and the contact link. Um, so I'm going to hand it back to, uh, to Ross or, or, and or Jacob. Uh, and I really want to thank you for your attention and for joining me today and, uh, do support, uh, Banyan. It's one of the, just one of the best stores anywhere. Thank you so much folks. We've been talking to Dan Millman, the peaceful warrior himself talking about his brand new autobiography, his memoir, peaceful heart warrior spirit the true story of my spiritual quest thanks so much to all of you for joining us the the banyan community is so fantastic and having people join for these live events is, is so wonderful and uh, a big thanks to jacob Steele, our our events curator and podcast producer for all that he does and of course all the staff and ownership at banyan a uh, huge thanks for all of your support and um wishing everyone a wonderful day Good year. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom, a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound. 
Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. And I'm your host, Ross McKeechee. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com.